Hi, my name is Jamie and I'm the lead games designer for Shadowborn Games and we're going to talk to you today about the iterative process of making a piece of art for a board game. Um, Dong John's been working with us now for about four months and um, yeah he's an incredible artist and he asked us to help um, give you guys an idea of just what's required um, from a from a from a board game piece of art, um, and just how we, um, we we go through the process from sort of start to finish. So just a quick um, explanation of who we are. So um, we're Shadowborn Games. Um, my, um, I'm my Jamie Jolly, and I'm the lead designer. And um, the game we're making currently is called Oath Sworn Into the Deepwood. This is a game that we've been spending nearly the last two years working on. Um, Donjon's been on team working with us as the lead artist for about four months. And this game is um, a dark horror. RPG um, fantasy game where the players are taking control of the Oath Sworn, this group of badasses who go out into the deep wood to fight monsters and gain loot and have an adventure. The, the deep wood itself is this unnatural, miasmic, horrid forest that has grown up un, um, and has taken over all of, the, uh, all of humanity um, and when it came about 500 years ago cities were destroyed and collapsed in on themselves and people were eating each other and it's just this terrible um, terrible terrible time and out of that only a few um, a few sort of ramshackle cities and towns left were left standing um, and so you have most of humanity living inside these incredibly cramped tightly packed pressure cookers of humanity um, people want to get out but the outside is the deep wood and so inside you've got this this terrible overcrowded starving population and outside it's even worse because you've got the deep wood and the monsters um, and so we're building this dark fantasy world um, where things aren't exactly going right but in this world there's a ray of hope you've got the 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 oath sworn you've got these people who are prepared to go out and basically fight for humanity um and fight for um fight for the sentient races and um amongst that group are people like the the ursus war bears so um they're these these guys who basically come down from these frozen lands and um uh, and come to fight uh, the monsters and they um try and earn glory by um by, by taking on the, 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 the creatures that are out in the deep wood. And whenever they kill a creature, they get to write in a story on their armor um, and add another piece of plate to their ensemble. Um, and so, as you say, this is, this, is a, this is a very deep world. We've got loads and loads of stuff we're doing. And so Dong John and um, his brother Dong Bao, um, both incredibly talented artists, are helping bring this world uh, to life with these incredible pieces um, and so what we wanted to to do for you guys is to really talk about um, how we get to a the uh, finished piece um, how do we get to one of these pieces of artists the iterative process um, and so we're going to tell, go, walk you through one particular creature that we're that we're making currently which is the satyr now um, the satyr is a pre-existing concept in mythology um, it's kind of like a, a panish puckish creature half beast half man um, lives in the forest um, uh, gets up to mischief and so the we wanted to because we're a dark fantasy setting we wanted to take this um, to take this uh, more horrifying more terrifying um, and so we had this um, idea that this character would um, be able to have these incredible hallucinative powers that he could stare somebody in the eyes and take over their mind and make them see things and do things they wouldn't want to do um, and so uh, we, we wanted to have a, a creature that was that had this incredible psychic ability, but also had a very physically powerful presence. So we ha wanted to have something included in that, which was more like a werewolfy type um, feel, and it would be huge. It'd be like twenty feet tall, and so he'd be um be mind controlling people on the on the game and they'd be like throwing themselves off trees and attacking each other whilst he marauders around chucking all the characters left right and center and um and nomming on them so the, the, we had this idea for a character but we then needed to be able to get that to the art team and and, uh, and make it real so we created um a spec sheet which is the way that we've um, the process we like to use for creating the art pieces and the spec sheet basically covered all the little details that Dongzhou would need to know it was um the the level of detail we needed because some of our art pieces don't need to be a hundred percent his best work some of them can be um sort of quicker pieces that are just going to be smaller uh, areas of the game but the the big monsters the big kind of hitters we wanted to have very high quality so this particular monster is a hundred percent art piece um, and then we wanted to give him information about the type of um the the type of uh, area he was in what type time of day it was the kind of situation the group find this creature in um 
And so we, we added all this to a spec sheet and added a little inspiration board with images like this and this that would help um, help him kind of funnel these ideas. Um, and so combining the law and the game mechanics and these visual elements into something coherent. And so we asked Don John to come up with a few um, sketches quickly just to give us an idea of, uh, of how it might sit. And he went away and a day later he came back with this, this incredible like masterpiece of, of creature design. Um, and yeah, this really high quality, um, this quite quality piece. Um, and he really hit, hit the nail on the head um, with the, the requirements that we had. Particularly, the head was wonderful. The way that the creature is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the way the creatures are staring at you, um, really freaking you out. And we we had had this um, part part of the game. Another requirement we gave Don John was that all the monsters look you in the eye when you see them, um, because they because we're playing for a story. We wanted that first moment you see the creature to be as if you just encountered them and they're looking at you. You're looking at them and you know you're about to fight. So we um, we asked that and he, he brought that out perfectly. So um, we had this they had this wonderful image to to, to work from. And um, he, as you see, he incorporated a lot of the satyr parts. He incorporated the hooves and the kind of man-like qualities, um, and then the sort of bestial elements as well. So we had a really good, uh, good start. And we um, then passed this over to Toby, our sculptor, who then kind of put this together into um, an early version of the, mod the model. And um, we, as you can see here, like it's um, it's very, very rough and ready. The thing, the main point of detail was the head for us, um, because we have um, there is an issue that can happen sometimes between 2D and 3D art where it, uh, an image can look really good in 2D um, but then it's very hard to translate into three dimensions uh, because it wouldn't always um, make sense when you when you look at it from one angle when you then spin it around it starts to look out of proportion um, or look a bit weird and so you have to kind of take a bit of, of artistic license with the pieces of art that are given um, and so we ended up going into uh, we had started off with something like this, where we had this kind of more wolfish face that we were trying to look at because it looked a bit more like the original image. But then we had to kind of meld that and then bring it around eventually to this, where it was much more um, uh, kind of a mix of the two worlds, where it's not exactly the same as the image, but it also makes it, it makes it look much better from a 360 degree view. So um, we had this... Um, we had this image uh, and we we had this image and we had turned it into this um, and what quickly became apparent to us is that um, although this is an incredibly nice piece of art when it comes to being a miniature it doesn't actually feel complete because um, miniatures are obviously a uh, an area where um, they they thrive on detail and a miniature almost has to tell its own story completely and having these little bits of detail in um, is very valuable um, and so we wanted to have um, although the head is incredibly uh, emotive and tells a good story the rest of the body actually as as is with normal satyrs don't have an awful lot to tell because they're quite standard they have he has you know, arms and legs and the rest of it and so we wanted to add more detail in this in this area and so we came to the conclusion that we needed to have a have a, a more dynamic pose that was that was kind of coming giving more of the creature's character across um, and then also the inclusion of a staff would be very helpful so we um we we put a few quick sketches together to pass back to donjon and um, had a look at some of these um these different poses and had this idea for a staff and as we started talking about the staff um uh, some ideas started rolling and we started to have more of a, an idea of where the story might go with it and so actually now this staff that was kind of a gnarled branchy type thing turned into actually this um this staff where actually there are people strapped and attached to this staff um at the top and there's maybe two or three people that are all um all, all like in, in torment on top of this staff and instead of talking himself the satyr can um, manipulate these people on the staff with his psychic powers his hallucinative powers and basically talk through them and so the, the people on the staff raise their heads and talk to the player rather than the satyr himself doing it he's just grinning maliciously all the time um, and so this added a nice little story element um, as we as, as uh, and sort of as you can see the iterative process going from one thing to another um, really starts to help inform where we go with the story and um, and so what we did is we, we we kind of had these ideas and then we tried to put them back into the model and so we ended up with this um, where 
the, the, the model is looking much more dynamic in its pose and we've got somebody attached to this staff. Now, this was just a first um, iteration of the staff and we thought, okay, well, this staff, maybe it looks a bit too wide and fanny. We need to bring this uh, in a bit um, and we maybe need a few more people attached to it. And um, and so what we're doing now is is we're at this process. We're, we kind of come into this video mid-process where, um, where we've got a few more things to add to this to give more shape to it and to define some of the other areas. So, um, so we've got the staff, obviously, but we want to have that edited by Don John in a minute to be able to make it look a bit um to be, make it look cooler make it look better um, and then um then we all, what we also wanted to do was have um uh, a feeling of the age of this creature that this ancient is an ancient creature and actually there's um a lot more detail then that we can add so rather than being this kind of like 20 year old kind of pin up <laughs> kind of uh, youthful looking thing we're going to add uh, a sense of, of of age and so in the wrinkles and the moss and the gray hairs and all the rest of it that we add in here we can actually add a load more detail which will help make the the, the main body of this creature look much more interesting we're then going to maybe consider adding some um, some bits maybe trinkets or some other areas to it um, that would help um, increase the detail level on it so um, what we're now going to do is I'm going to pass this over to Toby, our sculptor, who can then talk you through some of the other areas that we're just going to add in before we then pass this back to Donjon, who's then going to do a paint over of this piece for you live. So um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this part. Hello, uh, my name is Toby O'Hara. I am uh, the sculptor for the upcoming game that is called Oath Sworn. Uh, making this video to help uh, Dong Jun with one of Dong Jun Lu, one of his um, his instructional videos that he does for his various Patreon and Gumroad uh, campaigns. And uh, Dong Jun is the lead artist, the art director for this game. And uh, my job is basically to take his amazing creations and turn them into 3D sculpts. And um, this game, Old Sworn, is the uh, first game for a company that uh, Jamie Jolly and myself own called Shadowborn Games. We recently created this company uh, specifically to release board games, and in the future, we'll, we're going to um, also release things like books and RPGs and some other board game uh, IPs to come along with it. But um, we're just starting, and uh, we're, we're excited about what we're creating, especially with, with Osworn. We think we've got uh, a really great idea for a video game that we're excited to share with everybody. And we, um, we're, we're putting everything we have into the game in terms of uh, finding the best people to work with. And, and as you can see just from this artwork here, this, uh, this, act, this piece here was done, done, done by Dong Jun's brother, Dong Bao who uh, is another fantastic artist. So we have uh, both Dong Jun and Dong Bao as our, as our artists for this game, and the, and the level of artwork that they're creating is just out of this world. And so we want to make sure that the sculpts uh, do justice to the amazing artwork that they're creating. So um, in Jamie's video, which should have preceded this video, um, he kind of gave you an overview of what the world is and um, what some of the the races are that are involved with this this world it's something that Jamie and I have been developing for close to two years we um, we started from just simple concept world building having discussions about how the world should work and what are the metaphysics and is there you know is there a god or are there multiple gods and how did the world how did this world come about and why does it exist and why is it important for you know, the characters to matter? How do we create the backstories that make everything both believable but also exciting and engaging so that it gives people a reason to play beyond just playing a board game? Uh, we want to make sure that the world that we're creating is, it gives people a reason to come back and find out more, which is why we're planning on supporting the game itself with not only successive expansions and other board games behind it, but also support it with literature, with uh, either no novels or novellas or short stories, and all that stuff will come along as we uh, get closer to the Kickstarter launch, which we're tentatively scheduling for, um, at the earliest I think would probably be September of 2019, so next year, so a little over a year from now is when we're, we're shooting for it, as long as everything lines up. So you're seeing the very beginning 
of the development of this game with uh, the concept artwork and this is actually a finished piece of artwork for what the the deep wood will look like which is where the majority of the gameplay experience will take place which is kind of a sentient living forest that um, it has destroyed most of humanity and all of the of, uh, just consumed the land and, and destroyed any possibility of um, sustaining life outside of itself so uh, it's a pretty dystopian world and there's a, a lot of hardship and there's a lot of um, evil monsters that live in this deep wood some of which uh, came about because of the kind of a possessed demonic influence that that the that the forest has on the wildlife so uh, much of the game that you'll play is is you and three friends trying to beat one of these big monsters that lurk in these forests and there'll be supporting story to give you a reason why you're fighting that that beast or um there will also be a kind of a choose your own adventure element to the to the gameplay experience and it's going to be a legacy board game so um you'll be able to level up a character and we're gonna we're planning on having um <clears throat> probably somewhere between eight and twelve different characters for you to choose from and level up uh, throughout the the entire board game experience so uh we're we've got big plans for it it's going to be it's a very big undertaking there's a lot of there's a lot of components there's a lot of story there's a lot of artwork that's going into this but we think it's going to be uh we think it's going to be fantastic and we hope everyone will like it um so the, that is the game and again uh this is the company that uh that jamie and i own that we're going to launch all of our games under uh, and this is just an example of some of the artwork that I've worked on in the past uh, for various board games. This is actually from Jamie's uh, most recent board game that he developed called Farsight, and I did all of the miniatures on that game. And Farsight was actually recently nominated for Strategy Game of the Year. So congratulations to Jamie and, and his team on that one. Um, and again, this is how Jamie and I met. We met uh, while we were making his his latest game. and. After that was was over, we got to talking, and that's how we started to uh, come up with ideas for more board games, and, and we came up with the, this game Oathsworn and created a company, and the rest is history. So um, in the previous video with Jamie, he was, he was kind of giving you the backstory of one of the monsters that you'll fight in this game, and it's called, it's, it's a satyr. And we, we tried to use some traditional archetypes of monsters for the game world, but there's a lot of stuff that we're creating that's kind of an amalgam of a couple of different archetypes. But um, the satyr is one that we, we've always, I mean, I'm a huge World of Warcraft fan, and you know satyrs are, are, are a pretty influential piece of that, especially if you're a, a Night Elf fan. Um, but this was one of the monster types that we wanted to create for the game. Uh, and in Jamie's video, he was kind of showing you how we took a satyr design and kind of merged it with a werewolf, just to kind of give us a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a spin on on what we thought the the design for the monster should look like. And we gave uh, Dong Jun that some of the artistic influences and the ideas that we had for that character, and he produced uh, this piece of artwork. And this is what I am now taking and going to create a 3D model from it. Um, but during the course of um, kind of evaluating this design and, and as I started to translate this into 3D, Jamie and I were, were kind of looking at it and saying, well, we, we just wanted them to have more. So we, we, we thought that the design should change a little bit for it. So um, we decided that maybe we could give them a cool staff or some sort of a, of a, a totem or something like that that would... Uh, kind of give a little bit more of who he is, what his personality is, and kind of how he works. And uh, in the game world, this character, his main weapon against most of his enemies is is essentially mind control. And he can hypnotize people, and he uses his stare to lock in on somebody and manipulate them. And so one of the ideas we had to kind of give him a little bit more personality is we said, well, what if he doesn't speak? And instead of speaking, he has this staff that have victims kind of crucified to it, not in, you know just tied to this this staff of his. And he uses his mind control to have them speak for him. So if you're in a if you're in the forest or you're in the deep wood, and all of a sudden you start hearing voices and they're speaking to you, odds are it's it's this guy with his 
staff full of, of victims, uh, you know, speaking and, and reaching out to people. Um, and he, he'll figure into the very beginning part of the story when we introduce you to the game. Uh, and we're thinking that he'll be the first bad guy that you fight. So again, you know, what I'm doing is taking Dondrian's artwork and I'm turning it into the 3D model, which is um, what I'm going to show you today. Just some of the things that I that I go through and some of the choices that we've made from a design standpoint and um, some of the considerations that I have as we look forward towards the production aspect of it and things that I'm looking for to make sure that that we can actually produce the models. So uh, I just started with uh, a very simple base mesh. Um, I, I took it from an old human biped character that I had and uh, and then I started pulling his legs out and reshaping his legs just with simple uh, just with simple move brush and, and sometimes I use the, uh, you know, the snake hook brush. Um, I'm using ZBrush obviously for people that uh, may not be familiar with the 3D world. Uh, ZBrush is hands down the best 3D um, sculpting software out there. It, there's, there's other ones, but uh, when it comes to the number of tools, what you can do with this, and um, it's just phenomenal. I've been, I've been sculpting for about uh, six years, five years. Um, I've had many mentors along the way. I didn't, I didn't go to school for it, but I kind of did small schools. There was uh, where I first got my introduction to what ZBrush was and how to use it. Um, there was a a online game school that was called uh, Game Character Academy, and it was run by uh, a great guy named Rich Diamond. And he, uh, if you don't know who Rich Diamond is, he actually is the guy who created Drake from the Uncharted series. He was the lead character artist at uh, Naughty Dog, and he he created most of the main characters uh, for the Uncharted series. And um, he then went on to work at Blizzard for a little while. He worked on he can't confirm it because obviously he can't he can't talk about it. But um, I think he worked on that that Project Titan, which. You know, was defunct, and then I think it basically evolved into Overwatch from there. But, um, but while he was there, he and uh, uh, another guy named Judd Sementoff, uh, who was a, a uh, an animator there, um, created the online school Game Character Academy, and I was part of the first and only group that that went through it, and uh, so I learned how to basically how to sculpt and how to do character art with you know everything from. Uh, the modeling to the texturing and to getting into a game engine and stuff like that. Um, and I'm infinitely appreciative for everything that Rich showed me. I learned a lot there. And also Pat Murphy. Uh, he brought uh, Pat, who was the lead character artist at uh, Sony Santa Monica, working on the, um, the God of War series. And he worked with, you know, the, the, the all the amazing artists that were there. Um, and so I learned a lot from both both Pat and uh, and Rich, and then I did a I did a course because uh, I really felt like I needed to study anatomy better in order to get your sculpts to look good and to look believable. You really need to study anatomy. It's 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 just you have to because it, you can't fake anatomy. It, it, when you look at a sculpt, if somebody doesn't understand anatomy, you can tell immediately just because of the way that their the muscles aren't connecting in the right spots or there's muscles showing up where there shouldn't be any muscles and, and things like that so for your sculpts to be great you, you really need to study anatomy and so i took um i took an anatomy course through cg um cgma the cg cg master academy and there i had a fantastic instructor uh, named christian bull who taught us how to sculpt anatomy and it was probably the best anatomy course i've ever taken so if if um if you're getting into sculpting and you want to and you really want to learn it you know beyond just learning how to use zbrush i mean you can you can learn to use zbrush in a couple of weeks it's with all the tutorials that you can find on youtube and um uh also um online through uh the game art institute which is um I could show that later, but anyway, um, it's a great place if you're if you're just trying to do like a, a course on ZBrush or uh, um, just to learn the software. But anyway, learning anatomy is is just key to your sculpts, and um, so that's that's kind of how I got my technique down and understanding how to sculpt, and and then a lot of it is just being at the computer sculpting as much as you can to not only learn the software but to get good at. Uh, 
learning how to sculpt and practice anatomy and everything else like that and just always using reference and stuff so um everybody who sculpts everybody who models always has base meshes lying around because you don't always want to have to start from a, a simple sphere and start pulling out arms and things like that every time you want to do a sculpt so you, you know you want to start from some sort of good base mesh that has good polygon uh, spacing equals equal size polygons and things like that to help you with uh, all of your sculpts but um so for for this guy i'm hiding his face i'm sorry put that back on um, for this guy I started from this and like I said I just started pulling out his legs and what you're looking at uh, in this mode is these are polygroups and I, I polygroup as much as possible because it just it allows it allows you to pose but also work on areas without affecting anything else so if, if I wanted to get in here and just work on his thighs I could just select that and hide everything else so whatever I do here I'm not impacting the rest of the model whereas if I had done that that same brush stroke over here you can actually start to move other geometry as you move around. So uh, working with polygroups is, is essential. And it also gives you a chance to you can mask off certain areas. Because as long as you're masked off, you don't you can't affect the geometry. You just all the stuff that's not masked is what you affect. Um, so I just came up with this. This is a very simple base mesh just with a neutral pose. And I have the hands separated just because when it comes to sculpting hands, in order to, to be able to see any sort of uh, anatomy underneath that you need a lot of you need a lot of polygons because obviously things like veins and bones and things like that that are going to push through the skin um, you need enough geometry there to show it and if you attach the hands to the rest of the body when you're doing that um, it's very difficult to to maintain a light model and by light i mean a low polygon count if you look up here in the right corner you can see the, the number of polygons or it's, it's active points so basically divide that by four and that's how many polygons you've got um, in the model uh, and this is just everything that's in the entire in the entire uh, file but if you keep the hands attached to it and then you start subdividing um, and subdividing is is basically um, every time you subdivide it divides every polygon into four pieces so um, sorry wrong button um, as I subdivide you'll see more polygons in there than you ever were before. I subdivided twice. And what that does is just gives you a better surface to sculpt on. Because if you don't have enough, if I just do a simple brush stroke to show you, if I do a normal brush stroke, that's the type of result I get because it can only move what polygons are there. But if I add more geometry, now that brush stroke is gonna look a lot different. It can get much more refined, get you know really detailed in there. But if you don't have the polygons to do that with, I can't make that brush stroke. So um, that's where all the detail comes from, is just subdividing your model. But if you look at this, this has more polygons in it in terms of the spacing than that does. And the reason for that is because, again, I've got to get detail in there. And if I have the two of these together, it just exponentially increases the size of the rest of the body where I, I don't need that that geometry there now because I'm not doing any of the sculpting there. So it's just easier, it's lighter to keep keep certain pieces separate. That's why also why the head and everything is separate. Um, it's just my workflow. I work with a lot of different sub tools until I get it to where I want it. And then I start merging down and then I might join some of the meshes together depending on uh, what I need it to do and how the final 3D print is gonna work. But um, so this was my base mesh that I started with and I didn't put a lot of time into the body because really what matters first is the head because this is going to be the main focal point of the character so most of the detail that and, and most of the focus that people are going to have is going to be on that head and this was just a very quick dirty uh, sculpt that I threw together it's if you look at it it's just ugly and it's it's meant just to give me a sense of spatial relationships how big is the head in relation to the rest of the body are the horns the right side do they need then they need to be bigger they need to be wider um how does he feel as a character from uh, you know what does his silhouette look like is this is this the right shapes we want you know do we want uh do we want to have a, a wider shoulder and actually when i f i did a, a first pass on this when we um when we first started, or when I first started playing around with this character, I had his shoulders much wider, and he just looked way too beefcake. And we, we said we we didn't want the the satyr to be like that because he's kind of a he's kind of a loner and a scavenger in a in a very dangerous world. So and he's very 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 old. 
um, you know, thousands of years old. So we, we want him to have a feeling of being that old, but also we don't want him to be super muscular because it would kind of imply that he has a certain level of health that we don't want him to have. We actually want him to be kind of like a hermit and uh, scavenger and he's, he's just fighting for whatever food that he can find. Um, and so we kind of want to give him a, a bit of a, of a thinner emaciated feel to him. Um, but anyway, I started with the head and one of the big challenges with sculpting when you're starting from a 2D piece of artwork is that what looks good in 2D doesn't always translate to 3D. And, and as the sculptor, you've got to make choices in terms of what, what you can bring over and what you need to modify in order for it to work in 3D. Um, a lot of times you'll see a really cool piece of artwork um, and because of what, however it's posed and of perspective and things like that, you can't get it to look like the 2D art just because if you, it's just physically impossible. You know, the, the way um, a 2D piece might be, um, even for if I just use these horns here, um, if I'm not careful, because uh, he's got the, the ears are in front of the horns and beneath the horns, that's, a, that's something I have to pay attention to because as these horns wrap around, um, or that's the that's one of the interpretations I have to make. Does this horn uh, go backwards and then wrap around, come forwards, and then swirl, or does it come straight out, make a right hand turn, and just come down and under? Um, and then where where do the ears fall in that? Well, when you're looking at the 2D piece, it would imply that those horns go backwards away from his body and then curl back again towards him to kind of have this this area resting on his shoulder, and then kind of uh, just tail out like that. So when it comes to interpreting that on the model, there's a couple of different ways to, that I've got to figure out how to do that. Uh, how far back do I push that? Uh, do I need it to be, uh, do I need it to do it? Does it need to be closer to the shoulder in order for this part to sit on the shoulder? How far back do I need to curve that? I can't come too far back or otherwise it's gonna, it'll look weird. Um, and then how far, and then what do I do with the front? Do I turn the front and just bring it out sideways or do I push it back further? Um, those are all the, the choices you have to make based on the, 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 the way that this is rendered and you can interpret it a couple of different ways. So um, that's just one example of the things that I need to, to consider uh, in terms of how to translate that into 3D. Uh, the other part that, that gave us a little bit of a challenge was the face itself. And when you look at this piece of, uh, of art, it kind of gives the impression that the forehead is flat and it's actually quite tall. If you if you think of uh, think of the basic shape that this would be, which would be kind of a block, this would be the front edge of the brow, and it shoots back to a flat a flat forehead, and then the eyes kind of sit should be sitting on the side of the head if it's if it's kind of like a wolfish face, and then this looked kind of really flat. Uh, the way the lighting is, it, the, the nose looked really flat, but. When I was looking at that, I just I felt like all of that was too flat. So I was I didn't start there. I actually started from using wolves as a reference. So the the first kind of series of sculpts that I did with the heads kind of had that wolf-like feel to it, where I, I kind of gave it a more of a of a rounded a rounded face and we weren't we want we knew that the focus again had to be on the, the eyes because we wanted to have the stare really uh, kind of creepy out and I we weren't sure whether or not we kind of wanted to give him a smirk or a grin or, or what have you um, so when I first started playing around with what, we, what do we want it to look like I I kind of started from a wolf to just to get myself situated and as you can see the the ears are really close to that which is different than his 2d artwork this almost gives the impression that the horns start right at the ears and go way back to get away from the the to get away from the ears because there was a lot of space there but my first pass at that obviously when you're dealing with the anatomy of it and where you're going to stick those ears if i put those ears too far forward up in here then they're basically right there with the eyes and they just it didn't look right so i had to i kind of followed a little bit more of an anatomical reference from a wolf and the but just push them down rather than the ears being back up here where they are, would be on a normal wolf. I had to push them down to make room for the horns. Um, and I, we were playing around with different looks for the eyes. We weren't sure if we wanted to kind of uh, give this uh, a wide open, almost like a you know a crazy look to his eyes. Um, but anyway, we didn't we didn't like this look, so we went on to a, a, a different iteration where I just scaled the head down a bit. 
um, gave it more of a grin and pushed his nose up. Uh, or, you know, this is when a, when a wolf snarls, obviously all the muscles in here kind of bunch up. So I tried to exaggerate that a bit. Um, but again, when you, when you, it just didn't read well compared to the, the artwork. This, the artwork was, had a, it has much more of a human face almost uh and a shorter nose the way that this was here and i think the noses that i was playing with originally were just they were too long so it gave this entire v too much of a v shape and too much of a long face compared to the artwork and so we didn't we didn't really like that look um and this one i just tried to kind of expand the the width of the jaws and things like that to to see how that would feel but um we finally started to zero in on i gotta change the eyes there because our original set I had different eyes and different teeth that I was playing around with. Um, so finally I just said, the heck with it, and just started muscling the thing around, pushed the nose in, flattened the forehead out, and we said, okay, that's actually closer to what we're what we're thinking. And let's let's basically use that as the base and let's let's go from there and see what we can do. Um, and then the horns obviously right now they didn't match the they didn't really match this at all. This uh, the artwork here obviously it's there's um, there's a ridge Put it in there why can't i see it there's a ridge up up to the top there but then it gets kind of smooth after that and my original pass at it was literally just to get shapes in there so i could figure out how all this stuff was going to fit together um so i just kind of followed a, a little bit of a different uh, horn design which i carried over to when we we really started pushing the, the face to make it feel more like the the concept work and uh so this was this was basically where we said, okay, I think that's going to work. That's that's what we want to do, for for as close as we can get it to to the artwork, where at least the eyes are a bit more forward set. He has that stare. Um, I brought in some different teeth to make him look more, uh, yeah, just to make it look scarier. And um, everything is its own geometry here. If you look at it. There's all, everything is just simple shapes, simple. I just started with a cylinder and smoothed the thing down and to get a shape of, of a tooth. And then I took an old uh, skeleton model, uh, skull, uh, skull model that I had and just took human teeth and started pushing and moving those things around. And uh, to get the, um, just to get the feel of it. Because when this thing gets into the actual model and we 3D print it, you're, you won't know what that, what that looks like there'll just be enough detail there for you to see the teeth um, so it's it, when it comes to getting a 3d sculpt ready um, for print and for board games your choices are very different than if say this was going into a video game if this was going into a video game i would have to really care about those teeth and how big they are and i'd have to get rid of all of these these lines um, from the different polygons i'd have to subdivide that to smooth it out so that it was a completely smooth surface and because you're going to need to uh, all of that's got to be retopologized and you've got to pull normal maps and do all your texturing and things like that so it, you don't have to worry about that in the board game world because obviously this thing is only going to be you know four inches for this guy because he's a monster he's going to be four inches tall but if if he was just a normal character that was going to be on a 32 millimeter base he would basically be a little over an inch tall so all of that detail in the teeth, you would never see it. So you don't really care. So you just got to get shapes in there that'll that'll kind of give you the impression of it when it goes to print. Um, so once we got the face where we where we liked it, I started playing around with the beard, and as you can see, it's just separate geometry. And I do that because it's much easier to sculpt the the, the pieces that you need when you need them than it is to if I were to start pulling geometry off of his face and sculpting hair. It just it's unnecessarily cumbersome you know if I start pulling stuff off of them um, you can see it just starts really pushing the geometry to points where it can't it can't do much um, so a lot of us uh, when we're sculpting we just as many pieces as we can get um, we we just use as many uh, sub we, they call it sub tools but it's as many small models as we can get because when this thing goes to print as long as two models are physically in contact with each other, the 3D printers will read that as one continuous model and it'll print that all as one. So the um, even though this thing might be 10 or 15 separate models that, um, that we send to the printer, because they're all connected and they're intersecting, it'll read that as one model and print that all as one piece. So it makes, it makes the modeling process far easier in the board game world than it does in the video game world. Um, 
so this was just a very rough uh, beard that I threw in place and I actually started that with a uh, with just a sphere uh, to show you quickly how I could do that um, I'll just show you I'll put a piece of geometry in there and you kind of move it into place and you scale it and you just get it where you want it and I turn on see right here I don't have symmetry on which just means whatever you know I sculpt whatever I sculpt it's it's uh, it, it will happen at that point but I can turn on symmetry so that I can sculpt on two sides at once and it's just a quick way to work when I when I first start I'm always working with with symmetry just because it speeds up the process when you're just trying to find rough shapes to get into to get into place let me turn the old beard off when you're just trying to get stuff into shape uh, into place it doesn't really matter um, how you get it there it's just a matter of getting it there so that you can do something with it um, and you can see what happens to the geometry when you sculpt with stuff you're literally just pushing stuff around and it gets all crazy but uh, they've got this little tool here called z remesher and what it does is it takes a look at your your the volume of your model and it tries its best to put nice equally spaced polygons into place for you so that it makes it easier for you to sculpt uh, with uh, it's just a lot easier to, for for you to manipulate the uh, the model, but this is all I did to get that beard into shape, uh, just to get it into place, and you kind of work it up the cheek a bit, and then um, just work with some. I try to work with planes as often as possible. Uh, whenever you're doing uh, anatomy or, or things in general, you kind of try to break everything down into a rough. Uh, a rough basic shape you know it's no different than than 2d art where you start with you know cylinders and and squares to get your human and add you know, if you're building a you know bipedal character or something like that um, you just you work with planes and it's the same thing with sculpting you try to get that general feel of it based on uh, based on planes and then you can start getting in there and uh, doing more detail so if I'm trying to do um, you know fur or, or something that looks like fur or a beard or something um, it's very easy to now I just have to worry about big shapes and getting things into place and um, when you start when you start to use um, or when you start to kind of push to the the detail level you know without before I started sculpting those lines in there you're just getting the big shapes in there but when you start going after details I don't spend a lot of time in the uh, symmetrical world because it just looks if everything that you do is symmetrical meaning the left side and the right side are exactly the same thing your sculpts start to look boring and people will notice that so if if I did a if I did a beard like this and every hair on the left looked, looked like every hair on the right it's it's just not it, you're gonna get bored it's just not a the best way to do it so I, I don't spend a lot of time in symmetry I start to break it up and, and bring some asymmetry to it just to just to make it feel more organic make it feel more alive um, it just starts to look better so um, that's basically how I, I generally get stuff into shapes and, and the beginning process is literally trying to get as many pieces and, and building blocks into place that you can get an overall feel of, of what it looks like and you could start making your decisions of, of where to go forward um, i don't get into details until the very end everything i do is just very rough approximations and uh kind of placeholders i might put something into place just so i can i can see it and then i'll completely redo it kind of like i did with the horns this was literally a placeholder that i did in 10 minutes uh, just to, to to get an idea of how i wanted it to look um, to show you how uh, how I created that it's actually really simple I started with the head and there's a brush inside of ZBrush called curve tubes and when you draw with this brush it this is a, a curve and then you let go and then you've got geometry and the cool thing about this is it gets I can do a there's a million ways to skin the cat I could I could you know use use a a tubes brush like this if I wanted to I could have brought in another sphere and started stretching and pulling that sphere out but it's just you know it's 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 all about your workflow how you want to do it uh, I try to find the easiest fastest way to do it sometimes and then other times I will take the longest way to do it just because I don't know what I want to 
uh, do with the actual design of it. So I, I'll allow myself that 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 time of sculpting brainlessly can give you a, a chance to to make those decisions subconsciously before you actually get to that point. So um, with the horns, though, there's just a simple horn. So um, some settings that I use for it, and I lock the start. And there we go. So what I did is just pulled out some geometry, and then once you've got it into place, you can then. What I did before was I locked the start, so wherever that starting point was, now when I when I move this, it'll always keep that where I left it, and that's how I get the basic horn shape kind of into place. And then when it came to uh, the There's a there's a, um, there's a setting in the brush settings that allows me to uh, to change it so that the the behavior of this I could start it with a wide cylinder here and it can go to a point um, rather than go through all that right now because I forget where it is it takes me a minute to find it and I don't want I don't want you to have to sit around and watch me s fish around through menus to find it um, so that that just gives you an idea of how I did the rough the rough idea or, or the rough shape of of the horns and then once you get it into place. Um, You can just kind of start smoothing it down and getting yourself the that tapered that tapered feel to it and then i, I can still move it and, and adjust kind of how i want it um, same thing with the, the top part of it and then once you got a basic shape you, you start subdividing and so that you can start sculpting because obviously like i showed you before um, i couldn't well, actually, I separate it too first because right now these two are, are together, so I have to be careful if I start sculpting on one, it could affect the other, it could affect the other two. So what I do is uh, I just take this, I hide it, and then there's a button down here that allows me to split it off into its own tool. So there it is, and then I can work on this independently without anything else. So I just get some geometry in there, and then you just start. Sculpting, uh, sculpting some details, and if you looked at, if you looked at the reference, his, uh, you know, he's got kind of a series of growth rings with the with the spine to it, and it also looks like the way the light's showing that there's kind of a, a spine that goes down the side and one up the top. So the way I interpreted, the way I interpreted that was um, same thing is, is to get that that side spine in there. Smooth some of this out. Get rid of the uh, the artifacts. I'm just using a smooth brush. It, it takes everything and, and averages out all the vertices so that it looks like a, a nice smooth surface. So um, this is just how to get how to get that uh, that ridge into place, and then you have the that upper spine. And I'm just using this to kind of give me a uh, an idea of where I'm gonna put those those growth rings or those those ridges that kind of look like a they almost look like a human spine. Um, and right now, again, I'm working with symmetry just to get rough shapes into place to get make sure everything is is where it should be. Um, so even as I'm even as I'm doing this, I know eventually I'm gonna break symmetry and I'm gonna make the left and right look look somewhat different. Um, and these things actually came down like this. You know, kind of like that. Um, one thing that, um, from a sculptor standpoint, is you, you have to kind of manage your, your subdivision levels. And the polygon count you can see up here that you're up in the, you know, there's a lot of polygons there. But as you, uh, as you come down, you can see how the, the sculpt changes because there's just not enough geometry there to support it. As you, you step through the subdivision levels, but um, the amazing people at Pixelogic in this latest release of ZBrush, which was literally just a couple of months ago, they introduced a new, well, it's not a new feature, but they incorporated a, a feature from one of their other products called Sculptress. And what it basically allows all of us to do now is instead of always having to worry about our subdivision levels and whether or not we've got enough geometry in a specific area to, to do to do sculpting, 
they introduced the uh, the sculptor's uh, functionality, which is I think it's kind of like voxel. Uh, it just behaves a little differently. And but basically, what it does is it looks at the reticle, the the reticle or your your cursor, which is that red circle that's on there that that tells you how big your brush is, and it basically will add geometry to that location on the model for your brush stroke to give you the the effect that or to give you the amount of geometry that you need. So I could actually um, back this out down to its lowest subdivision level, just like this. You can see that there's no polygons there. So when I try to sculpt that, I can't get a lot of detail there. But if I let me delete all the geometry that's there. If I use Sculptress mode, it looks at the reticle and it'll actually add geometry. As you can see, it's adding geometry to that mesh so that I can make so that I can make these strokes. And that's really a game changer for, for all of us that sculpt. And it, it scales with, with your cursor. So if, if my cursor is really small, it just adds that much more geometry and that completely changes the way our my workflow is because I no longer have to worry about stepping up and down through levels to do my sculpting I can just have a big base mesh like this and then just sculpt some detail in there and smooth it out and it's it was really a huge change so it this is actually the first model the first character that I've ever sculpted with this new functionality so it's really changed my workflow so I'm I'm still figuring out how the how best to do it and I'm, and I'm learning as I go but um, it really is uh, a liberating thing from a sculptor standpoint to be able to add that type of detail into something that's very low geometry because it allows us to keep our polygon count low and it's important to us because unless you've got a supercomputer the more polygons you have in a model your computer just starts chugging and it can't you know it's just it can only process so much information and zbrush actually doesn't use your video card for processing all that information it uses your processor um, so it's it doesn't behave like a, a video game or you know your traditional like you would think a um, a traditional um, application would probably use your video card for pushing all those that information. But when it comes to ZBrush, it actually uses your uh, your your CPU. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of my approach with with getting stuff into shape. Uh, the last thing I could show you is just a general. Uh, approach to posing because obviously this is the guy that I that I start with but I've got to get him into some sort of a pose that that is interesting and dynamic you know something like that and to do that we just use um, we, I use masking along with uh, the transpose tools that they've got so I'm gonna turn off symmetry so I could show you what I'm talking about so if I want to move um, if I just want to move his legs I turn off Oh yeah, because they're all the same poly group. Um, the reason why I'm selecting that is, even though I've turned off symmetry, these are both the same poly group. They're both grouped together, so I've got to I've got to separate those independently. Sorry. Um, and then I do that like this. Where is that group visible? There we go. So I can separate these. Now, when I select one, I should just get one. So if I wanted to move, if I wanted just to move that leg, I would mask off the rest of the rest of the model, and then bring that mask back a bit. And then you use their, you use these transpose tools, just to get that in the right spot. It's a good idea to anatomically get things where where the hip actually does bend, so that that the the uh, the actual motion of it looks looks right so it's it's just it's a tedious process but this is essentially you know how you how you pose your models to get things into place um, slowly but surely and it's the same way with hands I just go I literally go joint by joint knuckle by knuckle then and move slowly move uh, the hands into place and then my finished pose or the pose that we're working on right now we might change it again uh, but the finished pose that we're working on right now is this. And obviously I've taken this model a little bit further because once, as you saw it back here, you know, obviously there's no, I don't have any of the anatomy sculpted in. And then when I got here, obviously I've started to put in the actual anatomy. Um, and I'm exaggerating the anatomy pretty greatly just so that when you see this thing on the table, obviously if... Um, 
you know, you, your eye's gonna wanna catch surfaces. You're gonna want it to be interesting. So I'm exaggerating the anatomy so that it'll read really well when it's on the table. Um, when he's posed and he's on the table, he'll be on a 100 millimeter base. All of our monsters will be on a 100 mil base. And so his height is four inches from the top of his mane down to the, to the base. Um, so he'll be a big guy. And uh, as you can see, obviously this, this horn set, I pushed a little further. I'll probably still push this a little bit further, add in a little bit more detail. Um, and as you see, I, I broke up the symmetry so that the left and the right don't necessarily look exactly the same. And I'm gonna add more of that in. Um, and a lot of that might happen after I do the first 3D print. So once we get this guy to a reasonable spot, uh, we'll do a 3D print uh, on our 3D printer. And then based on how that looks, I'll have to make changes to the model, I'm sure. But, um, you know, for example, one of the things I want to see is whether or not this beard reads well when he's printed out. Even though, you know, he's he's going to be four inches tall, which means that head is going to be close to an inch big. I think that that should read okay. But when we do the 3D print, if this just kind of looks like one big blob with a line here and there, then I'll come back in, I'll re-sculpt this, and I'll make the I'll make it feel more clumpy. It'll be uh, bigger, bigger pieces, bigger bigger strokes so that it reads better on the model. Um, and again, because this guy, when he's attacking you, he, he's using his, you know, his eyes to try to control you. I wanted to make sure that the pose gave that feeling like he's looking down at his adversary and he's gonna, you know, he's trying to hypnotize them. Uh, I'll put this in here. This is not an actual character in the game, but it gives you a sense of scale. This is just a dummy model that I, that I created really quickly to, to, to show, um, a sense of scale so this would be a character on a 32 millimeter base all the characters will be on a 32 bit millimeter base against the big the big monster um, so this will be the sense of scale of your character that you're playing with versus the bad guys um, so that is that guy and again a lot of this like I said is just me getting stuff into place to make sure that proportions are right that it looks cool that it'll it'll it'll, it'll read well when it's on the table uh, it'll read well at a distance. The, it, those are all the, the, the considerations that are going into it, other than just does the sculpt look like the 2D artwork. Um, I've got to worry about the production aspect of it, of whether or not we're going to be able to, um, how we're going to mold this. So obviously this can't be, it could be, but I wouldn't. we wouldn't obviously want to mold this as one big piece because he'd be a six inch hunk of plastic that weighs a pound. And if we've got you know 10 or 11 monsters that the weight gets heavy quick and you'd have an enormous box that was really heavy and no one would want to play the game because it's too heavy to carry to the table. So um, once we're done with the sculpt, I'm have to go, I have to go through and figure out how we're gonna break up the, uh, the sculpt so that um, it's, efficient from a material standpoint and it's hollow because we don't want this to be a thick piece of plastic but also we're, we're designing the models that the ones that do need to be assembled will be very easily assembled with push fits no so there won't be any gluing necessary there won't be um i don't even want to use snap fits because snap fit implies that once you assemble it you can't take it apart uh, i'm going to design these so that you can take these things apart and put them back together and they'll hold well and they'll they'll carry well they'll travel well you can pack and unpack your game quickly um, so i'm going to use as few pieces as possible and make it as energy or uh, material efficient as possible when it comes time to uh, to assemble these models and still hold all the detail um, i'm confident that that we can do that with um, some of the technology that we're using to get there so we're we're trying to make our models to be state-of-the-art some of the not only the best detail that you've seen but also from uh, from an engineering standpoint and, and putting them together and taking them apart we're gonna we're taking it to the next level we're not just we're not just slapping plastic pieces together and saying okay done we're i've got uh my background is actually in engineering i spent 20 years in aerospace and medical devices designing and developing products <clears throat> and i have a close friend of mine who is uh, working with me who's also an engineer and we're we're engineering each model at the same time as sculpting and 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 making sure that they look amazing, but also that they function as well as they can. So we're, we're trying to set a trend or we're trying to set a standard with the models from more than just a detail and, and an aesthetic appearance, but also from a, from a design standpoint and from an assembly standpoint. So um, this is just a, again, this is, I'm still, I would say I'm probably halfway done with this sculpt. I've still got to figure out what we're going to do with the, the fur. Uh, I just have some placeholder fur in there right now. 
Uh, but to give you an idea of one of the things that I'm deciding between right now is in the artwork, he seems to have pretty hairy, pretty hairy legs. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of hair there. Um, and obviously when it comes to the sculpt, I'm going to have a lot of hair in the, in the midsection, but the legs uh, is what I'm toying with now of how much hair to put there. Um, so right now I've got basically no hair, just a little bit down near the, uh, there the feet. Um, so what I'm experimenting with is either going complete hair like this, which I'm not a fan of after I did it, but I'm going to, I'm going to get with the team and see what everybody else decides. Personally, I think it's, it's too, it's too much. It's too busy. You know, your eyes go all over the place. Your eyes don't have anywhere to rest when you're looking at that foot. There's just, it, there's too much there. So what I'm trying to play with is the idea of just putting some hair there to give the impression that there's hair and uh, just in key locations and, and stuff like that and see how that feels. But I'm going to, I'm going to show Dong Jun some of the, the renders out of this and see what he thinks. Um, but that's just a, an example of an artistic choice that, that we need to make. <clears throat> I'm a personal fan of less is more. I think when people sculpt models, especially when it comes to fur, and they put so much fur on there that it just it looks so busy. I, I don't personally think it looks good. It, it, there's, it's just too much. Um, so I think that there's, there's a balance between indicating fur and going overboard. To me, when you go with something like this, that's... To me, it's a bit overboard sometimes. It, it, sometimes it makes sense, you know. If it's a uh, if it's a wolf, obviously he's a, he's a, gonna need more fur on him. But when it, we're talking about something that's got some hair and some skin, uh, I'm of I'm of the belief that less is more. So this is just an example of one of the design choices that we'll make uh, for this model before it gets to the final version. Um, and one of the big purposes of doing this video is that uh, because of the design changes that we made, Dong Jun wanted to kind of redesign his uh, piece of artwork a little bit more. So uh, what I what we did is we gave him a, a 3D render of just this kind of in a pose like that. So he's going to do a paint over uh, in in this tutorial when when he's uh, when he's done. Uh, it's going to basically use the the model as his base for painting, and then he's going to go over it. And the other big thing he's going to do. Is design the is design the staff. I I literally just threw a bunch of pieces in there and threw an old mesh in place to kind of give the idea of what we wanted to do. Um, I, we we felt like this was a little too wide, so we basically asked him to make a, a thinner version of this with at least three victims um, tied to that post. And uh, hopefully that's what he'll do in his video that comes after this. So. Um, this was just to give you an idea of where the 3D sculpting comes from and how it's going to work. Um, and uh, that's about it and kind of what my workflow was. But one last thing I was going to show you as a surprise. I didn't, I didn't talk to Jamie about this, so I don't really have approval to do it, but I wanted to do it to show people where we're going. In the, in the game world, we're going to have, uh, obviously there's humans, but we have a few other races to make the world a bit more interesting. There's going to be a race of kind of plant people that we're calling the Dendri that are really interesting. And we, we're still working on what the design of them would look like. There's also going to be a bird race of people that, again, we're, we're designing what they're going to look like. What I can promise you, though, is that it is not going to be a bird head on a human body. We're, we're, we're looking for unique designs that are as original as we can make them. So the plant people won't look anything like any other plant people that you've seen in any other game that you've played. The bird people won't look like anything that you've seen in any other game you've played, which we're, we're, we want something to be very original and uh, to fit the game world that we're in. And one of the races that we're, we love is the, the race that we call the Ursus. And the Ursus are essentially polar bears. But where, um, where they come from is uh actually it's my desktop so i can just show you my desktop this is one of dong jun's uh, pieces of artwork for the the race of characters called the ursus um we really like the idea of of them we were, we're excited of of what they are and and, and the, the story that we're creating for them but essentially they are a wandering nomadic race in our game world and their main drive in life is to basically live a grand epic life and to have a story to leave behind so they're always in search of adventure and danger and they want to overcome battles and they want to find the biggest baddest thing in the world and go kill it and they when they're done with whatever it is that they're accomplishing they they scroll their life story onto their armor so in our game as you're leveling your character up and you're building that story your character would be kind of uh, adding new armor pieces to themselves to 
to tell their story. So you go out and you kill this bad guy. Now he's got a tale to tell. So he wants a new piece of armor that he can scroll his life story on. Or maybe he wants to make a new weapon because he doesn't have enough room on his armor anymore. So he's going to go find a big axe and he's going to put his life story onto that to, to continue his, his saga. Um, so that's kind of who they are as a people. So as you go through the game, um, you'll be able to kind of create that life story and, and have it reflected on the model. We're, we're trying to design the character models so that they are... Uh, interchangeable in terms of the components so that you can actually swap out weapons or swap out armor sets on the model and it's a technological challenge uh, but I'm pretty confident that we can do it based on our design choices and how we're going to break down the model to uh, to show that so uh, what I wanted to show was just a rough scalp of the Ursus war bear here and this is just an idea of what we were doing for a pose um, and how I want to make sure that these these poses are dynamic and that they look like they're you know they're attacking and um, but this is a very rough sculpt it's even more rough than anything that I've showed you before and I just I did a very quick sculpt of an axe and and uh, just a quick sculpt of the bare body and um, you could see that these are just basic blocks that I just threw into place to as placeholders so that I, I could get an idea of of the proportions and how big they're going to be. Um, whereas your normal human characters will have a 32 millimeter base, the Ursus, because they're bigger, they're going to have a 40 mil base. So we're going to get the model will be bigger. When he's standing next to a human, he's going to look noticeably bigger. Um, so that's that's on purpose. So um, just an idea of, of what's to come. And we're planning on doing more of these videos with Dongjun. So hopefully the next one that I do will be of an Ursus War Bear sculpt. Uh, and we're gonna have, like I said, we're gonna try to break up these models in such a way that you can you can change your, your, your loadout, essentially, your weapons and your armor on the model itself. And um, so I'll do that by basically for, you know, if it was this War Bear, if you wanted to have a hammer instead of an ax, I would probably break the sculpt up right here at the shoulder so you just take the whole arm and the axe off and then put the new one on and that'll make sure that you know you don't have anything that's too small and it's breaking apart or you're losing it at least that way it'll give you uh, there's enough structural material there to make sure that it'll hold it and you don't have to worry about snapping things off um, and we're designing them in such a way that when you push fit them you don't have to worry about uh, snapping them I'm not going to use pegs into a hole or anything like that we're going to there's different ways different uh, geometry that we can use so that these things fit together um, and I'll probably separate the torso from the legs so if we think of how many pieces something like an Ursus war bear would have we'd probably have the legs be one piece attached to the base and then we'd have one torso with a different set of arms so that um, so that you could swap things out uh, there'll also be a pose where um, you could have two of the, you could dual wield these claws if you wanted to, or you could have a two-handed axe or a two-handed hammer. So you'll have you'll have choices to make for not only what your your character looks like on the board, but those choices you make for your armor and the choices that you make for your weapons will actually be be reflected in your abilities. So um, there'll be unique abilities that are associated with a one-handed axe and a different set of abilities that would be associated with a two-handed hammer. And that would be reflected on your on your character board when you're playing. So the the, the unique abilities, obviously, that are associated with a one-handed axe, wouldn't be available to you if you were using a two-handed hammer, and you'd only have those those skill sets to use. So that's that's our that's our plan. That's the direction we're going. And unless there is some technological reason why we can't accomplish that, that's that's what we're trying to do. So this was just a, a sneak peek what I think that we'll probably do in our next video is, is something with the with the Ursus I'll have I'll have the sculpt push further along uh, we're still working on concept art for some of the different weapons and the armor sets and things like that but the, the premise is for especially for um, your characters as you level up your your armor should get should look, start to look even cooler and more uh, you know more complex and elaborate and, and stuff like that kind of like in the traditional mmo sense as you're leveling characters up and you're earning new armor earning new weapons things will look more epic as you as you increase in, in your character level um, but you'll always have that choice too that if you like if you say hey i don't i don't want the ursus to have shoulder pads and cool chest armor i like this look i want him to have that that feral gladiator look then you could always play like that and just just change out your uh change out your abilities to reflect that so it, there'll be a lot of choice it'll all be about preference and and uh, aesthetics and, and how you want your characters to look so um so yeah hopefully that'll be the next video
Um, so that should just about that should just about cover it in terms of uh, what we're going to show you for this one. So the next part of the video it will be, as far as I know, would be Dong Jun doing a paint over of this guy and redesigning the staff. So um, stay tuned for more to come, and uh, we look forward to sharing this entire development process with everybody because we want we want to share as much as we can with people so that they can see where it was coming from and and where it started and. Uh, not to say that this this guy might not change. We might do a different pose before this thing gets into the box. I don't. We don't 100 percent know yet. But um, um, so that's the surprises to come. So uh, thanks for sitting with me and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Hi hey guys. So uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to making this 3D model. Okay, to uh, to the illustration level. Okay. And thank you very much for uh, Jamie and Toby to contribute to my tutorials. Okay. And uh, yeah, and also this awesome uh, 3D model from JBrush. Okay. And I got uh, some different layers from Toby as well. So yeah. <coughs> so uh, the reason why I'm going to making it to uh, 2D is that uh, uh, in our product in our game we're going to be using uh, first is this 3D printing model okay another one is we how to using uh, 2d illustration okay so with this 3d help we can have more accurate 2d image okay all right so hopefully i can uh making this one so this is uh my first time to touch over on this 3d model okay so uh this tutorial is not going to be like a teaching how to making it okay Basically, this tutorial is more like uh, I show you how I'm going to fill out the, uh, all this with play with the, all these layers and with add more details, textures, okay, to making 2D painting feelings. All right. So yeah, let's quickly have a look at this. So uh, before I start, maybe I just crop this. Uh, just select this, copy, hide for backup. All right, so let's open Dark by Start. Okay, so yeah, this is a uh, very nice shadows. Of course, some of detail shadow we can uh, fix later, but this is uh, good enough to show the big shadow first. Okay, so according to shadow, uh, I understand the lighting is coming from this top. Okay, top down to looking, uh, top down to uh, hit that feelings. Okay, so probably I am uh, making a bit of soft lighting here I'm not going to make in this huge sharp shadow okay and uh, probably I put the more uh, sharp lighting in the back of back side of this character maybe probably from that side okay so the lighting is coming from that side just make it simple all right the soft lighting to hit down maybe this one is a bit more cold this will make it more hot all right so and uh, with that I can just select this here and I just using uh, some white color, okay. Okay, I think this is uh, some kind of locked, okay. But doesn't matter, okay. We can just paint over later. And that is more like a kind of uh, bounce lighting from the surrounding environment, so that this, uh, uh, so that this overall, just using creepy mask here, or our boundary is not that going to be too much sharp there okay so which is a good <coughs> and we have this lighting uh, maybe this is a bit too much maybe just turn down a bit the screen okay so this is a more like also uh, uh, reduce the contrast of this uh, just add a bit more lighting here and we have this more multiply shadow, which is soft shadow, uh, which is also good. But I just, I think this is a bit too much. Just turn the few down a little bit. All right, and let's quickly drop color. This layer, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to using this one, but uh, we, we just keep it first. And I create another layer on top of here and the right clippy mask here. And we're going to be uh, making overall, uh, what would say the 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 color first. Okay, color. Or you can just go back, select here. You can easily to control you, uh, colorize. 
on, on top of this overall values and uh, yeah the overall design is like uh, this creature have a uh, more red red color skin okay so probably push a bit more hair hydration and we got strong warm lighting so it can probably add a bit more warm lighting on the boundaries okay and the soft lighting here is a bit cold so we can reduce a little bit the situation later okay so shadow part is more higher saturation warm color so and after that let me figure out a little bit more okay and the at this kind of thing here is a bit too bright okay this is because of this 3d model okay the material feelings skin cannot reflect so much uh lighting if we have soft lighting coming down so uh we have to also figure out the more of this value here as well so probably i just click here and go to a uh, curve let's turn on this value first slightly down somewhere here is good i think not too much maybe we can also using click and going to uh brightness contrast okay just turn that down a bit the contrast and turn down a bit the brightness so for those highlightings we can always uh add later okay but the overall skin uh shouldn't show too too kind of contrast there so make it a bit more soft all right i think this is a good okay and uh, what else and we can also i just create another layer right clipping mask and just using this skin color red color and just uh, paint over some of this part so that it's not too much to look like a you know diverse material right? and i'm going to uh making a hard light and just turn the few down okay and this bottom part actually we don't have to put too much lighting here as the yeah, the foot is not that important area so yeah, of course in the reality maybe the lighting can hit here, but the, uh, we may also uh, just turn down some specific area and lighting those important areas so that we have more contrast point. Okay. So I'm just using this uh, higher saturation warm color and keep your mask at, and we just darken some part okay, so impurposely. As an artist, the way how to know uh, how to design all these things, all right? So like death flag here, that human may probably a bit soft lighting here, okay? And those is not important there, well, we just hide them down. And even death part also, we can just turn back down when it's going down, all right? So just paint our more, more shadow. Just make it more soft a little bit. Yeah, it's just quite sketchy right now, but it uh, doesn't matter, okay? So uh, don't do me right now, just figure out this overall first. Overall, the relationship of the lighting and the shadows, right? And try also try to design a little bit. Even the color here also, just one color right now. It's definitely not good. Just quickly drop shadow here.
Okay, don't worry to move to next step. Just uh, uh, yeah, stay, stay uh, calm and uh, just uh, uh, watch along and just figure out uh, slowly all this detail uh, lightings. All right, I think better than okay. This one just put the shadow okay, and after that, mm. I just create another layer and create the clipping mask. Of course, this all this step is you don't have to follow exactly what I'm doing. It just come with uh, quite a random uh, steps. Uh, yeah, so you, you you cannot just remember all this. Okay, you have to remember all this. What is the effect look like? Okay. And all this effect, you have to uh, uh, practice long, get familiar with them, all right. So and using uh, just uh, more flexibly, and then just using a bit maybe pink blue color, which is cold color, and using airbrush. And I'm going to figure out this soft lighting, which is here and here, and probably here. Okay, it's moving around, which which are right this part. Maybe a bit hand here. This one, uh, we have to uh, go to maybe check color first. Of course, it's too much contrast here, so we just go back here, turn down that fuse down, All right? So we slightly up, uh, kind of different tones, the depth of the color here, okay. Okay. And also we uh, figure out this slightly backside uh, rim lighting, warm color. So I'm going to using this a bit warm color, clip your mask as well. And from the outside, using side of your brush, just clicking some of real lighting here. Maybe a little back of this guy. Okay, no, no bottom. Okay, maybe there's bottom have lighting, but uh, yeah. As long as uh, we uh, we have over focus on lighting at the top of here, okay. And probably we can hit here. I'm not sure. Okay. The side face. Uh, let me see if it is good or not. I think we can slightly adding. Hmm. Let's add first. Okay, have a look. And we may go to a uh, color dodge. I turn the field down. I think it's too much because I think this giant horn is going to block some more lighting there. Maybe a little bit of ear is fine. This part also is going to be no lighting here because we have big head here. Maybe slightly indicate a little bit the head hand area. This side, this part. But the lighting here I think is a bit too uh too saturated. Let's turn on this one. Turn down situation of your what I say the, the the lighting okay okay not bad I get this lighting Maybe a bit more here okay and let's create another layer. When they also let me check, and we can also uh, making this close with different colors. Okay, a bit less saturation, kind of warm color. And 
me check color. You can check actually hard light as well. Actually, this this is better. Actually, this is better. Maybe this part here as well. Okay, and this this part we can uh, try different color as well. So just create a new layer. This one we can try a little bit this. Down. Okay, uh, zoom out. You can also flip it. You can have a check before you proceed to the next stage. And this horn also, we can try some different color as well. Just make it less situation. Try some gray color here. More like bone structure. Okay, and we can also try hard light. Uh, not bad. Okay, we we'll try color as well. I think this also good. Okay, just. Turn the view down. And yeah, not bad. And I, I, I want just making the value a bit more contrast because it's hard structure. So I just copy this layer. And what I'm going to maybe we can check multiply and turn the view down. Okay, we can check overlay. Well, that's cool, I think. Okay. And the highlighting we can figure out later. But this is uh, good enough to show is a bit different values with your know, human the, the, the skin here. And yeah, then also the spare also we can also using some of gray color. And the bear may be a bit more uh, dark value, okay, more dark value. So we, again, similar stem, just cr create this and we can go to uh, multiply. Or if you want to change the color, you just put it in the back of your color layer, all right? And turn the field down. Okay, okay, um, let me check. Pretty much done, and uh, those letters here. So try more yellowish color. And we go to a uh, highlight. We can try hard color as well. Okay, not bad. Okay, zoom out, have a check. Create the clipping mask and create another layer. Yeah, and I, th I understand there's so much layer, so many layers, but uh, no choice. Okay, and here also we just, I just pat over the bottom leg part with different less situation color there. Okay. Zoom out. Hmm. Okay, and it just crops out some of this area. I think this is too much space. Okay, and we also can change the size. Okay, make size. It's a bit too small for the illustration, so you can using uh, of a hundred, five thousand. 
so that we can uh, just uh, work out some more details. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think uh, big color value I think is there. And we got the depth things. Okay, this is a kind of depth layer and uh, maybe we can using it uh, or just overlay actually it's very cool as well it could give you more depth okay but we don't have so, too much strong light in there so let's hide this first okay we can use it later okay this yeah I think it should be okay and it just turned on this one um yeah if you think okay i just copy this folder hide it again i'm going to just merge all this layer okay and after that i crop out this platform here oops i forgot this weapon Okay, can to shift the G to separate the layer and you can hide it. Yeah, and let me, let me see. This problem is a good as well. We can, we can just make it later. Okay. Put in the shadows. Okay, and uh, I try to turn up with this one because uh, I think a little bit off. What else? Let me check. I think with this we can proceed detail stage. Hmm. Yeah, I think the more details we can directly paint over. And we can also drop some texture. Very nice, beautiful, this hand sculptures from Toby. Okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe I can uh, let me check. Just crop this part. Separate that. Let me try to make it a bit smaller. Or maybe not. Okay. Okay, this uh, just uh, showing a bit of a bit of perspective a little bit more. Right? So it feels like this is really uh, kind of uh, larger size. This is a human size. Okay, 
and the pector here also we can add it a little bit more, right? Yeah, all these small details so we have to check. And this part to do. Okay, so yeah, and we can also uh, try some of texture. Let me see if I can bring up some textures and some of my reference. Let me see the angles. This actually actually very nice. Also here, just uh, flip that. And yeah, this kind of detail, the dominies. Interesting, they are toy. Let's put it here. Um, we can use soft light. That is too much color. Okay, so you have to open this one. Control view, turn down situation. You can slightly keep some texture color. Okay, you can also edit a little bit of this texture brightening. Is turn on this views. Okay, just using slightly. Okay, like this, All right? But before I use it, I just paint over by myself. Okay, you can just open as the reference. So this part, uh, lighten part is the uh, by lighting by this soft coat lighting. Okay. So you can just turn less situation, okay, the lighting part, a bit bright values. And sometimes you can also add a bit this hue to make it more cool. And shadow side, you can make it a bit more uh, hot, okay, hot a little bit. And higher situation, darker value. So this clothes also, uh, you can just make it more organic feelings, okay? Because this guy is living in the deep jungle, okay? So all this clothes maybe destroyed a little bit, make it more wild feelings. Okay, and uh, some some part sometimes this kind of wild creature, there is going to be have some noisy color in in some of specific areas like this this okay, so uh, yeah let's quickly drop maybe you can using this part just put it here because this is from real photos actually the color here is uh, quite complicated quite noisy okay, and just open that here. And we can go to filter blue at okay Gaussian blue, S just read it resolve this kind of detail there, and actually kind of give you a different color here, and you can using color, and turn the field down slightly okay using this noisy color quite slightly, small size right, it's moving around, so uh, sometimes yeah most of them you will find quite interesting. 
call the noise in there, right? Then I put here. Okay, quite interesting. Then just pay attention, never using too much obvious, okay? Otherwise, the color is becoming too dirty. You can also be making your own one, just making maybe some more yellow, greenish color, yellow color here. Interesting, okay. Very slightly, you see. Okay, just a lot of tips. And um, yeah, and the rest, yeah, just uh, should be. All the same similar steps, okay. So maybe I just. Uh, focus on my uh, details, okay? Sometimes we can also use texture as luminosity, all right? I just turn the few down. And you can also figure out some of details, see those kind of veins, muscles, okay? Yeah, it's, it's render out detail is really uh, kind of, uh, you know, it's, you have to keep focusing, okay, keep focusing. So I may uh, not talking at that stage. Yeah, I'm hopefully I'll see you later, okay. This also is quite nice, okay. It's kind of highlighting from this muscle, right. So yeah, try, try first. You never know which kind of inspiration you could get from the textures. Okay, see you later.
All right, so uh, yeah, we just uh, proceed more detail here, okay? And uh, I also add some of this uh, extra, some kind of decoration things here, okay? So uh, yeah, we can just separate this layer. So for illustrations, we can uh, uh, make it a little bit more higher details. I also put some of uh, these schools here. Okay, but uh, for, for real 3D printing, print, uh, we, we cannot go into too much details, all right? So, but anyway, you can set separate the layer and we've got the tiles here as well, okay? And I'm going to also put some more furs on the uh, body, okay? Cover a little bit the back of this uh, deltoid, all right? Okay, so yeah, just uh, make this extra. We will just separate, copy this folder for backup again. Hide that. There, so just merge it. And here I just turn a bit down of this close, okay? Just make a little bit the more contrast with this central uh, a human here, okay? So this is brings you more of this focusing point to this area. Okay, so after that I just merge it. And also add another just simple platform, the previous platform. Again, okay, just making some kind of rock, rock platform fillings. Thank you, some of high reflection. So if we like this, uh, uh, we can making this uh, creature more bigger toys. Okay, we can make it more details, right? Such as like this platform here, and also we can making a little bit more like rocky feeling this kind of platform. So yeah, it's as a production concept designer. I have to always think a little bit of this uh, product after productions, all right? Okay, so and. Uh, yeah, let's go back to this skin, proceed more of detail. So you can also making some of dirty marks. And this horn here, I just also drop some of this uh, dirty warm color. Okay, so it's like making a little bit more contrast with this top part uh, colors. So, uh, yeah, if I do uh, commercial things, commercial illustrations, like for just one creature illustration, I may take like one week to go, right? So I work uh, kind of a little bit slow, okay? Just make sure that every part is, is going to be correct, okay? But here, it's, since we are recording a tutorial, and I just get help from this, uh, from Toby and Jim, Jamie, so uh, yeah, it's making me make it uh, really faster. Uh, probably I can go this piece two hours more, and we can make it the final piece.
but I think this is also a good point if you working with a team you guys can help each other okay every people have different skills and we we do this production together okay so for just one one working by yourself it's quite difficult actually making too many productions so I think we got the 20 something if I remember correct 20 uh, this kind of big creature and we got the a lot of characters as well and also environment So this horn is it's kind of uh, making this layer by layer, okay? You don't have to make this age too clean and the kind of uh, too, too regular, okay? This, those are just make it more organic, some part is making different size of these layers. So I think this is also uh, uh, important for the details, okay? Whether you can understand the detail of these organic creatures. This is also important for this uh, creature designer, okay? Whether you can observe this kind of small, very small details from the real world. You can just make your design more interesting, even the small uh, details. So this is why it's different from a professional uh, creature designer, okay? With just the uh, uh, normal people who draw creatures. So professionals always pay attention. Of course, the big ship is important, but also to the very small details. Okay, just when you're painting, always stop for a while okay I will look I will look compare with the surroundings whether your painting is uh, uh, the balance is okay or even you can zoom out a little bit look at this overall balance whether this bright dot effect on overall balance okay they are all connected here okay don't just focus on one specific area too long time. And always make sure that where the lighting is coming from. Okay. Some some people ask me about uh, finding the job of this industry. Yeah, I would say that uh, just the focus on creating the uh, good portfolios and also increasing your skill as well. Okay, so yeah, this industry is very competitive and not easy to get a concept art job. Okay, especially for those uh, big companies. Okay, you have to certain levels there. But uh, uh, I want to say that uh, the reason why you cannot still cannot get job is that uh, it's you are not ready. Okay, it doesn't mean you cannot get job in the future as well. Okay, just uh, keep going and, and just uh, practice a lot, get it ready. Okay, when the time comes, automatically you can get job. All right. So I also don't believe this believe in this when I when 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 I was uh, just a looking job many years ago and some of my senior 
uh, friend also told me like that but I don't understand okay I don't understand if I increase my skill how those people uh, from how those company can can find me yeah but but in in reality when when, when I'm ready okay I, I realize that there's a lot of opportunity already there looking for me okay so opportunity is kind of looking for you if when you're ready so just don't think too much okay just yeah increase your portfolio no, increase your skill prepare a very strong portfolio yeah, and the companies will be the comp you, you don't have to look job the company will, will just hire you okay but of course you have to create your online portfolio to, to show yourself to the world all right okay the phrase a bit of fluffy you okay, can just uh, I, did, I did just uh, not focus here so yeah even the details I need to really pay attention okay sometimes when I talk I just lost a little bit right. so yeah I'm not talking too much from now on, okay only just uh, when I go if this is necessary I just talk a little bit so if you get bored you can just listen music okay Even this two horn shape also uh you don't have to make two symmetry. Okay, even you see this curve out in but this is this out in okay so it's quite different right now. So I I, I think I like it, okay. This comes with really randomly. But I like this happy accident here. Even this furs also, it comes with different size. So just uh, changing our brush size to work out some more s different size of this first. Maybe just really this spot so that I can erase this fur. And for the brush, I think uh, my suggestion is uh, uh, don't don't just changing too many brush. Okay, I just using this one brush. If you can see, okay, all the way. So I think this is pretty much enough for me. So yeah, that's why I'm very familiar with this single brush here. Okay, so I can play with this with different size, and uh, when I I can paint also soft surface, hard surface because I'm very familiar with that okay so I can play with all these shapes size of the brush And also try to uh, control your pressure, okay. And when I using uh, this brush with a different pressure, they all comes with different effects.
and I'll show you how to make this brush uh, just part of yourself okay don't just follow the other people's brush pick one which is uh, just a shoot for you and practice along with this one this horn is supposed to be in front of this uh, weapon but uh, anyway later we can erase this part a little bit You also need to uh, understand how to draw details uh, without zooming, okay? Like this, okay? Like this, even horns. Play with your feel, okay? Don't do too much let on your eye. Let the arm play it, okay? And of course, this needs a lot of practice as well, okay? It's really like a, 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 a football player, okay? They do not play with eye. They they play with this the feel. Okay. I think a uh, human is a very a very amazing creature. I think with a uh, practice. Human actually can do a lot of a lot of things which we cannot imagine. Okay, and this is the power. So yeah, sometimes like yeah, after a lot of practice, there is so amazing ability potential human got. It's like I think uh, the the movie which is called uh, oh, I forgot the name. Sorry. Let me have a think. The movie called Lucy. Okay, it's amazing films, and uh, in the film, uh, it's, it said uh, human only using twenty percent of their brain. Okay, the rest eighty is not not developed yet. So yeah, we can imagine if it is fully developed, how amazing it is. So yeah, it's I think it's exactly the same. Okay. Just keep practicing. You never know; you will be amazed by yourself as well. Okay, I think I'd not talk too much as well. Just gonna be have some shadow from this. And if you're creating a very big illustration, actually every single brush you're painting, you have to think carefully, all right? Because all the uh, brush 
actually also decide the style of your illustration now to uh, uh, understand how to using minimum brush pan out the, the, the material you want okay Okay, for the path refresh. Just it's a bit too clean, so we can just add some of this dirty. patterns here Create a little bit of vent, but don't make too obvious,
this is uh, not the uh, human human is dead side the death probably its own race of creatures maybe his enemy he just keep it just hang on here or just this family he can just uh, put it here for memory so yeah kind of this kind of detail story here And uh, I I don't put some kind of metal here, okay? Because uh, according the uh, script from our story, this guy's yeah just purely wild creatures.
can add some blood this area Okay, I think it is uh, big. Uh, most of the details are already here, and uh, I think this almost like eighty percent is done. And the next twenty, I probably using some textures uh, to get the really small uh, detail inspirations. Okay, yeah, and see you later.